Hey, so guys, my name is Chana. Welcome back to my C++ series. Right, so you're sick of being alone. You just, you need to connect with the world. This whole solo thing, you said it was good. You said you loved it, but it's over. And now, now you want to connect to other computers. What use is the world if we're not connected? So many quotes, so many great quotes. So how do you write programs in C++ that are capable of communicating? communicating with the outside world, communicating with other computers on your local network. How does one learn the art of that? Well, you've certainly picked like the best language for the job. I mean, C++'s library has everything, including, oh, there's no, there's no, there's no built-in networking. I don't know why I decided to treat this video like a TV show, I'm sorry. But yeah, it's true. Like C++ has no built-in networking at all. You have to use the operating system APIs, like the Win32 API, for example, if you want to use sockets and any other things that let you communicate with devices. Every other language, you know, like, I don't know, like C Sharp, Java, Python, they all kind of have, you know, that built in. But sure, you know, C++, UBU, never change C++. Do people say that? Anyway, I'll stop. Just in a joking mood today. Um, so first of all, let's kind of talk about what I mean by like networking in C++. Like what does that mean? Basically what I'm talking about is using sockets. Now these sockets can be used to transport data from one place to another. And it could be as simple as like, even on the same computer, you know, you could open up a socket that can receive data and you can send it like from that same kind of computer that's called like a loop back. You could also communicate to another computer on your local network. So that doesn't involve the use of something called a wide area network or a WAN. It's just kind of on the LAN, the local area network. And in terms of like networking hardware, you could just have like a switch, or I mean, you could even use one of those ethernet cables I remember we had back in the day. It's like, instead of being like a, what's it called? You know, they were like red or something. Ah, here we go, a crossover cable. That's what it's called, an ethernet crossover cable. Oh man, that just brings me back to like high school when we want to play like, you know, a LAN game, but they'd block it or something in the firewall in the local network, I guess at school. And so we had to like, people tried to like connect ethernet cables, one computer to another, and it wouldn't really work because I think the, I mean, the wiring has to be different. So you need like a special cable. Anyway, I'm a little bit sidetracked here, but then it could also be like across the internet. And of course that involves like using a router and like the things that could go wrong there, like you might need to forward your ports, might need to tame your firewall a little bit. You could obviously just use like a server, you know, like from hosting and the sponsor of this video, which we'll get to later. But that's basically what I'm talking about. And I'm not gonna go into like the deep, deep fundamentals of networking, A, because I'm not an expert on that stuff. And B, because I just kind of wanna practically show you how you can just get this working. Even though I love having a deep understanding of things and teaching that wherever possible, I feel like that's not always necessary. And at the end of the day, you just kind of wanna write code that's just like, send data to this address, please, and receive data as well. And as long as you can write that code and it works, like you can get on with your day and, and make the thing you're actually trying to make. So yeah, so that's basically what we're gonna be talking about today. What we aren't going to be talking about today, but I do wanna cover this in a later video is stuff like HTTP. So if you want to just download information from a web server via HTTP, so you can kind of, you know, make, get or post requests or stuff like that, all of everything to do with the kind of HTTP protocol. And yes, I know the P in HTTP stands for protocol, but it makes more sense if you say in the HTTP protocol instead of in the HTTP. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I should say in the HTTP. Yeah. So that will cover in a different video. So today is basically all about how do I send data from one thing to another and also be able to receive data from that thing. We're connecting two things together. I mean, honestly, it's gonna be more than two things. It's gonna be like one thing acting as the server and then all these clients, as many as you want really, limited by, I guess, hardware, connecting to that one thing. So a server client kind of architecture and you can just send whatever you want really between the two in either a reliable way or an unreliable way. So how can we do that in C++? Now, there are a number of networking libraries in C++ and I guess drawing from kind of like the time that I made the like the best way to make desktop applications in C++ video, which I'll link up there, by the way. I don't want to use libraries like Qt or Qt. I don't like there's this other thing called ASIO, which to me just like reminds me of the audio driver, to be completely honest. But there's Boost, ASIO, like anything with Boost in it. Like I, d I don't want to do that, you know? You feel me? That's just my vibe, I guess. That's just what I'm, that's just who I am. And speaking of who I am, I mean, I'm a, I'm a game engine programmer. Like I make game engines and I like making games. So that's kind of the world I live in. So that's, that's what I'm gonna base my recommendations on. That's what we're gonna kind of do today. We're gonna to use something that's gonna be compatible with, you know, a game engine and how you do things in a game engine, much like that desktop applications in C++ video, because you've come to my channel, you've come to my world. So the library that we're gonna use 
is actually by Valve, by Valve Software. You know, like Steam, Half-Life, Counter-Strike, Team Fortress. I don't know, what are they doing these days? Just making money from the Steam commissions, I guess, the Steam cut. They have a library called Game Networking Sockets. Here it is on GitHub. It says failing, but it's, it's actually a good library and it's succeeding in my heart. So this thing is just on GitHub, like for you to use. You can see that you can send reliable and unreliable messages over UDP. So it doesn't use TCP, but it works like TCP. So it's not only really bound by the potential limitations of TCP, it just kind of uses the UDP protocol the UDP, which is important for kind of games and performance, that kind of stuff. It's got some really great features. You know, I'll leave the link to this obviously in the description below, check it out for yourselves. And even though like in the API, the word Steam is used like a lot, it does not require Steam and the license is also extremely permissive. So you can, you can of course use this outside of Steam for whatever you like. And that's what I did. I thought the best way to kind of put this into action and like create a practical example out of this would be to just make like an application. So I made my own like instant messaging chat application. Yeah, like Cherno Chat back in the day, the network chat programming series for those of you who are OGs on my channel. Oh, it's just coming full circle, isn't it? Except this one's called Walnut chat instead of Cherno chat. Cherno chat is, that's vintage. You know, that's like, we that's legacy stuff. We don't touch that. So that's what the rest of this video is going to be about. It's going to be about how I made that application. I'll walk you guys through my kind of development journey of that. Uh, but like, yeah, it totally works. I'll leave the link obviously to all of the source code that's on GitHub. You can also download the release and like, I'll leave the server up for the time being. So you can actually connect to like this URL using the client, which you can download. And like, you can, you can, yeah, I mean, it works. I mean, is it like a, 100% secure and are people going to hack it? Probably, but hopefully the code is gonna be like a good example and a good starting point for those of you who wanna develop something like this where you can just arbitrarily send data to and from a client and server and uh, yeah, like in a proper like, you know, GUI application. So coming back to the beginning of all of this, I knew I wanted to make a chat application just because I feel like a chat application like is, is almost like a hollow world of like networking. Like if you wanna send data to and from something, like sure you could integrate it into a game maybe, but like, I mean, even games have chat usually, like text chat. So it kind of makes sense that you would create some kind of chat client. Uh, at least that's what it feels like to me. And so luckily for me, and actually to further my point, there's an example that is included with this game networking sockets repository that is this example chat thing. And it's a command line program you can download. It's all entirely within one file. And you just start it with like a command line argument of either like client or server, depending on what mode you want to run it in. And that's it, that's your chat application. So that's kind of what I based this on. However, like it ended up being something completely different. I ended up kind of learning a lot from that and abstracting that into actually a separate module for Walnut called Walnut Networking, because I knew that I wanted to use Walnut as like the core library since I wanted to have like a GUI here. And by the way, for those of you who don't know what Walnut is, Walnut is kind of like my application framework that I created, which I ended up updating quite a bit actually for this video and for this project. So this video is gonna end up being like a high level overview of all the different moving parts and how they come together to make this Walnut chat thing happen. We'll start by taking a look at the actual game networking sockets library and how to get started with that as well as how I took that and integrated it into Walnut, Walnut networking, and then the separate kind of client application and server application. We'll have a look at the actual game networking sockets API and I'll talk about how that went into Walnut networking and how I used it, you know, to actually establish connections, send data to and from server and client, that kind of stuff. The server application obviously needs to be able to run, you know, like on a server. So we'll talk about a headless configuration for Walnut, which enables it to be run inside a terminal. How I got the server compiling on Linux and this kind of Linux, yeah, if you can see it, this is a, this is this computer over here. <laughs> is a, uh, a Linux computer that we have in the office. How I got Headless Walnut running there, like inside a terminal with that game networking sockets library so that we could have the server there. And then finally we'll deploy it onto an actual real hosting a server. And that's how the whole chat.thegenera.com thing that you guys can connect to, that's what's currently running. Now hosting are nice enough to sponsor this video and provide us with a server to use, which is great because they provide full root access, giving us complete control over our server. I mean, we could even use it as a dev machine. Like if you don't have a Linux machine, you can just use one of their servers and build your code there. That plus the fact that they use NVMe drives and AMD Epic processors mean they're always a pleasure to use. They're just fast and responsive. We'll cover setting one up later in this video as part of the deployment. So we'll kind of have like a nice big overview of the whole process. Now, for those of you who would like more detail, like I am planning to make some deeper videos, but just leave some comments below on what you'd like to see and I'll try to make that happen. Step one. 
the library. So Game Networking Sockets on GitHub, all of the source code here. Important as always to read the license, make sure that you can actually use this. You can see it's the BSD3 license, so pretty good. Now, usually what I'll do while this is cloning is take a look at the building uh, section in the readme. It's amazing how often people don't do this. Instead of just like seeing a CMake file, for example, and being like, oh, I'm just gonna CMake this. It's really important that you just take a look at the building under the readme, especially when it like, you know, has its own page like this, uh, because it covers like all of the dependencies and stuff. It tells you how to build it on Linux, which we know we're going to have to do later. But since we are on Windows, that just happens to be my kind of default development environment. And also I obviously want to run the client on Windows as well. You can see that their recommendation here is just to use VC package for that. I'm not a huge fan of VC package, but when I'm building other people's libraries, especially ones that are fairly complex like this one, like it's got plenty of dependencies such as uh, OpenSSL and Bcrypt and like Protobuf and a bunch of other stuff that I don't want to deal with. I'm just going to follow their recommended build path. And there are manual instructions, like if you don't want to do that, but like, that's a lot of extra work. It's really nice when developers actually spend some time to guide you through every step of building something like this. Once we've cloned the actual game networking sockets repository, you can see that it guides us through every single command line like step that we need to run through. So we just kind of clone VC package right there into that game networking sockets repository. And then we launch a Visual Studio like developer command prompt, which is this special thing that you can do. If you just like hit start and search for developer command prompt, you'll probably find it. And then we just like run these commands. Now, one thing that I did do differently was they, in this example, just show using Ninja as the kind of build system, I guess, for this. So they'll use CMake, but they'll generate like Ninja build files and then actually build using Ninja. That's cool, but I wanted to use Visual Studio, might as well. So I just changed this to be like, you know, Visual Studio basically. I think it's like Visual Studio 22 or something, I don't know. Just the normal kind of way you would get CMake to generate, you know, instead of a Ninja build files, it would generate a Visual Studio solution and project files. And so once that was done, I could just open Visual Studio, I could build like a debug configuration, a release configuration, whatever really I wanted. Those kind of built binaries, that's what I use to link into Walnut. So I didn't bother actually trying to get this to work within Walnut itself. For larger kind of third-party libraries, I just like to build them like standalone. And obviously like I'll, I'll I'll retain and make sure I have access to all of the source code in that separate project just in case I need to build it with a different compiler or for a different platform. But I still like to keep that standalone because integrating this into like Walnut would be much, much, much harder. And also quite frankly, just unnecessary. So once that was done, I took a look at the examples. So as I mentioned, there is this chat example. I just had a look at this like in Visual Studio, made sure I understood it, ran through like most of this code. This one file, as I mentioned earlier, actually has both the client and the server in it. So the idea is like the usage, let's see if we can find the usage here. Here it is, print usage and exit. So basically you call, you, you call this through the command line and then you just say client or server and it runs whatever configuration you want. And you can see that obviously it, it like starts either this chat client or chat server class. So if we go up and take a look at this, you know, this is obviously what starting the server does. And that's the Steam networking kind of API in use. And this is kind of what I used as a reference to determine what I needed to actually set up inside Walnut networking for the client and the server API. Okay, so for step two, I had to set up a new Walnut project. Uh, I have this Walnut app template over here on my GitHub. This is an actual template that you can use. You can just hit use this template, create a new repository. I went through this to create this kind of Walnut chat repository. And that way I got everything kind of set up for me, which is great. Here it is, networking and CPP. That was the original name before I came up with this whole Walnut chat thing. And then I just kind of tweaked the build scripts. I actually ended up doing quite a lot of work here because I also needed that headless configuration, which we'll discuss in the future. But I basically ended up creating a few different projects here, app client, app server, app common, which sits between these two. And then inside Walnut, this kind of Walnut networking module. And you can see that this actual Walnut networking module, this is kind of what ends up linking this game networking sockets library. I'll put up a little diagram so that you can see how all of these kind of projects are linked together. Now, I thought it would be useful to also quickly cover what the actual Steam API even looks like. Again, I would recommend you just look at that chat example that is inside the game networking sockets repository. But basically, if we look at the server class inside Walnut networking module, you can see that the first thing we do is try and initialize game networking sockets. We then create this kind of interface from it. This will actually create a different interface depending on, I guess, the version of the library, but also whether or not you're using it in conjunction with Steam, because you can use this with Steam. 
but you can also use it completely not having anything to do with Steam like we are here. We're then gonna just set up this kind of local address with a port, any kind of configuration options we want. And then we create this listen socket IP, which is gonna be using that port and options and stuff that we specified. Now this interface, this Steam networking sockets, that's like your API. That's what you use to call any of these game networking sockets API commands. So here we're using it to create a listen socket IP. We create something called a poll group, which at the moment, again, Walnut will just create it for you, but that's basically like a group of clients that you can use to, I guess, more efficiently process messages from and send messages to. I mean, like one thing I didn't mention is that you can see I'm in the header file now. This is the iSteam networking sockets.h. This is like the whole API basically. And you can see just how good this header file is. Like look at this documentation, it's all here. It's wonderful, I love this. So you can see what poll groups are. Poll groups. A poll group is a set of connections that can be polled efficiently. And you'll see us kind of using that a bit later. So we try and create that. And then we just set up a while running loop, which every iteration will sleep for 10 milliseconds just to kind of reduce server load. That should probably also be configurable. Poll incoming messages. Well, you probably guessed it. It'll try and receive messages from our poll group that we created. Uh, and then if there's no messages, we just break out of this kind of while running loop because if we have more than one, we'll kind of iterate multiple times. Less than zero, I think is a critical error because that's what the example seems to suggest. And then this kind of message that we receive is stored inside this and that's got a size. So this is the size of the message and then it's got a data pointer, which is the data for the message. So you can see we can immediately just create like a walnut buffer out of it uh, and then just call the data received callback. So that's kind of incoming messages. The other really important part though is this kind of run callbacks thing, which that will invoke all the callback functions queued for this interface, which really is this, which is really, really important, uh, I guess, unless you're using Steam. So what that will do, it'll call this kind of connection status change callback, which will redirect to this function, and that will look at the connection state that has possibly changed. So this is important because this lets us handle client connections and disconnections. So like if someone's trying to connect, we can choose to accept that connection if that fails, you know, we'll close it, whatever, and then assign that client, that poll group, and also, you know, call our kind of walnut callbacks and stuff like that. But you can see we also register that connected client and we end up storing them inside the connected client's map so that we can then do things like send messages to everyone uh, and just have a record that that client even exists and is currently connected. That's really all there is to this game network is Ocus API. Like, of course, it's got many, many more features, but at its core, that's how it works. And the client side of it is very similar. The only real difference is that instead of create listen socket IP, we call connect by IP address. Like that's kind of it. You have the same kind of inco polling incoming messages, except there's received messages on connection instead of on poll group. Uh, there's still the same connection status changed situation. So yeah, that's kind of the API. So once I had all of this running and I was kind of happy with the features that I had both on the client and the server, more or less, I knew that since I had to have it run on Linux and in a terminal, like without IAM GUI, without Vulkan, without the UI, because the end game was of course to deploy it onto a hosting a server, which is just like a regular, you know, Linux server that doesn't have a GUI at all. So I knew that this clearly wouldn't work at all. I needed to set up a version of this server that ran just as like a command line application. And so to make things easier, I just did it here on Windows. I didn't bother like moving onto like some kind of Linux development environment or anything like that. I'll just get it to work here, like as a command line application on Windows first, then I'll make it work on Linux, then I'll deploy it onto the server. And so that's where this kind of networking and CPP headless was born. And just this whole concept of Walnut being able to be built in a headless configuration. Now a headless configuration, by the way, means basically command line program. So no UI, no, no window, no windowing library, no graphics API like Vulkan or whatever, just pure terminal kind of command line goodness. And so you can see that in this project, what we have is Walnut headless, Walnut networking that remains the same. Um, and then we have the server app and guess what? This is the exact same server app. The only difference here is that it will not set a menu bar callback, which has I'm GUI stuff because we don't have I'm GUI. Uh, the Walnut application is a bit different. So you can see it includes either application headless or application GUI, depending on what configuration we're building in. And by the way, application headless and application GUI, they're under platform, either GUI or headless, meaning that we can just not build platform GUI if we've got a headless configuration. I might make a separate video about how this headless stuff works because I don't want to take up too much of this video for that. But the really cool thing is that like, again, it's exactly 
exactly the same code. Like this is not a duplicated file. That's why it has these kind of if and def headless and stuff because like this code obviously won't compile. What I thought was also really cool is that there's actually a different console. So we have that UI console and we have a headless console as well. And this headless console matches this UI console in API perfectly, which is why inside the CPP file, whenever I call console dot like add message or whatever, like it doesn't matter if it's a headless console or a Walnut UI console, like the API is just identical. Um, and over here where we also set a message send callback, that's also identical. So if we type in a message into the UI console, hit enter, it calls our send chat message. And then if we do the same thing, but inside the terminal and hit enter, same situation. So that's great because we don't have to change anything. Like this code doesn't even know if it's running headless or not, which is fantastic. And if I just demonstrate that for you guys by running this, uh, then here we are. You can see it's exactly the same as like what that UI version looked like. Um, <laughs> and I can type here and I'll receive messages here um, and everything works the same way. So once I had that running on Windows, and obviously this actual like binary that gets built here, that doesn't link Vulkan, that doesn't link I'm GUI, nothing. I knew that it was basically ready to be run on Linux. I just needed to make sure that I, you know, made sure that the uh, build scripts, there was also like a version here that will build it for Linux using Clang, because that's what I wanted to use. You can see it'll call build headless. And I decided to use gmake2, which is a remake build platform, I guess. Um, that will generate these kind of make files that I could then just run to compile the program. Because I didn't really want to bother using an IDE inside Linux. This is a fairly simple project. Okay, so over here on the Ubuntu computer, to build game networking sockets, just go down to the building inside the GitHub repository, and there's a Linux section. Very, very easy to build this on Linux compared to Windows. I mean, I guess VC package wasn't that difficult, but this is easier. All I did was this, and then you can use Ninja or just normal make files to build it. Now, in order to build our actual server, our Walnut Chat server, basically what I did is I just modified the pre-make files to, when necessary, also have a Linux configuration for linking. So you can see over here that I'm linking the game networking sockets library from this path. And of course, this is the path where I put the binaries that we built by building game networking sockets on Linux. Once that was done, inside the scripts folder, there's this setup.sh file. If I just run that, then that's gonna run premake to generate those gmake2 kind of build files. So now what we have are these make files everywhere. So like app server, you can see also has it. We basically just use premake to generate those make files. So if we go back a directory now, we can just run make and you can see it's gonna start building our server and all of the dependencies as well. So Walnut headless, Walnut networking, app common headless, app server headless, all of those are being built. This is just in a debug configuration, but you can see it's done. It's linked it successfully. And now inside the bin directory, debug Linux, app server headless, we have our app server headless file. And this is just me copying the dynamic library manually into this directory so that we can then basically take these two files a little bit later on and put them onto our server. Obviously, before we deploy this onto our server, it would be a good idea to just try kind of running it locally over here. That's what I did. I made sure that I could communicate over the local network between this computer running like the server, obviously on Linux, and then also my Windows computer. Once that was all working, I would say it's basically ready to be deployed onto the server. Now, I am planning to make a bit of a deeper Linux video where I'm going to be adding like Linux GUI kind of support to Walnut, because Walnut at the moment only supports Windows. We have this headless Walnut configuration now, which does support Linux. That's how this is working. But I still want to be able to run like the chat client on Linux, you know, using IAM GUI and Vulkan and rendering just like we do on Windows. So if you want to see more Linux videos and Walnut kind of related stuff, let me know. It's time to deploy this onto a real server. That's where the sponsor of this video comes in, Hostinger. So Hostinger has a bunch of really nice server plans that we can use here. Uh, we're going to need a VPS. You don't have to worry too much about choosing, you know, a more expensive plan. You can just go with like the cheapest plan and then just upgrade. Uh, their prices, as you can see, are pretty good. Uh, but if you have a coupon code, which you guys do, you type in a uh, Cherno here and hit apply. Ta-da! Um, and then once that's ready to go, we can just hit set up, follow the prompts. I guess I'll set one up in the US. I usually try and pick whatever's closest to like where most of you guys are. I'm just gonna go with for a plain OS, to be honest. We're gonna go with Ubuntu. Uh, we can give it a name. Uh, root password, uh, definitely not share this with you guys. Save and continue. Finish setup. Now we'll wait. 
And actually, in the meantime, just open up a command prompt and we'll get ready to SSH in. So SSH and then whatever the IP address we get assigned to the server will be, that's how we'll get in. All right, so once that's done, let's hit manage server. There's the IP address, let's copy that. Back in here, SSH right into that. Uh, hit yes, actually forgot to say do root at, let's cancel that. So SSH, make sure you do root at, and then that so that we log in as this user, we put in our password, our root password, which uh, seems to have failed. Did I forget my root password already? I just made it. Now you can actually update your root password, which is a useful feature. Ah, 10 minutes, really? Oh, okay, it's done. All right, that was good. Oh, that took like 10 seconds. Let's try login again. Uh, okay, we're in. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I must have entered. Maybe I made a mistake during entering my root password. Anyway, so there we go. We're on the server now. Yeah. Uh, from here, there's several different ways we could get access to our code. Obviously, if you're just using Git and something like GitHub or GitLab, you can just do like Git clone and just check out your repository that way. Now, this is a fresh server, so I don't think we, we don't have Git. So you'll have to do like, uh, let's do a sudo apt update first. Just make this full screen. Um, and then we'll just do, uh, you know, install Git. Yes. Um, and then there you go, Git's installed. If you've got like a binary release that you've already got compiled, like we just did, you know, on that computer behind me, you can just download that from a web server. So if you have it like as a release on GitHub, for example, you can get it from there, just using, using wget or something like that. Uh, if you've got it locally, you can just use FTP to upload it. Uh, I think what I wanna do is I'm just gonna pull it off that computer and upload it like to the server. Uh, okay, so I've just uploaded it using FileZilla. Um, I made a directory called app. And then in here, you can see that we have um, the app server headless and then the dynamic library as well. Now, this is currently root um, and it's also not marked as executable. So if we try and execute it, it's not gonna let us. So let's just do a sudo chmod plus x into, well, probably everything here, to be honest. Uh, if we take a look now, they're executable. Um, they're root. You don't want to run this as root, definitely not. That's just honestly a disaster. What you wanna do is make a new user, only give them access to like a certain directory and then run this as that user because that will prevent your program from destroying the rest of your server. And because it's connected to the network, it could be a potential vulnerability. I'm not going to do that here because I don't care about this server. No offense to hosting her because this is obviously just a, a demo, but you definitely don't do this. I'm just being lazy and I probably shouldn't be. Uh, so if we try running it now, um, it'll tell us error while loading shared libraries. Now this is something like, I mean, look, the library is right here. So you might be like, why is this happening? The thing is on Windows, DLLs in the same directory as your exe just get picked up automatically. That's just how it works. That's not quite the case for Linux. Uh, at least, I mean, in my experience, it hasn't been. I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. So what I like to do is there's this like user lib location that you just have with a bunch of different libraries. I think what I did on that computer is I made a directory called like local or something. Um, and then I ended up basically taking this, which remember is an app slash that. So if I just do copy app slash that into here, um, you can see I now have that here. Uh, and then we can type in export LD library path equals this path that we've just kind of created. So I'll just paste that in. Run sudo LD config. And that's it. That should have hopefully worked. So if we go back to app and uh, I guess we just put it in here and we try and run that. Uh, you can see it's got a different file that it can't find because I forgot to grab that one. But this is actually kind of distributed in a package. So we don't really need to handle that manually if we don't want to. Uh, you can run sudo apt, is it list? Yeah, let's cut that. sudo apt list and then we can just grep proto buff or something. Um, so you can see there's quite a lot uh, that we can actually use here. Uh, let's try this guy. This is my strategy for just getting this to work. Uh, okay, so after doing some light Googling, uh, protobuf compiler seems to be the thing we want. So sudo apt install that, 50 meg. Okay, not bad. That includes a bunch of dependencies that protobuf has as well, of course. Um, and now maybe if we run our app server headless, we did it. Look at that, it's running. Hello. <laughs> uh, okay, so now I suppose we should try connecting to this. Uh, let me just keep this here. This is uh, very exciting. Let me grab this. So this is our, this is the headless one. I want the GUI one because that has the client. Okay, so there's app client. Sure, let's just hit F5. I'm oh, very excited. This is our server over here. Okay, here's our Walnut chat client. Let me pick a name, Jan. 
orange, of course. Uh, and if we go back to hosting art real quick, just to grab that IP address, we can just put that in. Now we know it's gonna be port 8192. So let's type that in, 8192. Connect, connecting. <gasps> We're in, hello. Look at that. Hi. And we get that over here. Um, okay, let's start another instance of this. So if you right click, go debug, start new instance. A lot of people don't know that, it's handy. You can see it loads our settings, but now let's connect as Cherno, who will be green for some reason. Connect, and we're in. You can see we download our yarn hello message. Let me just set this up a bit better. Ah, oh, it's all very exciting when you finally see it working for the first time. Hey man, then you spend hours talking to yourself now. That's the next step, really. What's up? So this is a three-way, a three-way chat between Cherno, yarn, and server. Um, okay, so let's try kicking someone. Let's kick Cherno. <laughs> kick Cherno. <laughs> okay, so user Cherno has been kicked. You can see it's brought up the connection uh, dialogue. He can just rejoin, by the way. That's... <laughs> no, stay out. I accidentally did kick with without an argument. Um, you see Cherno just joining and leaving. Good riddance. I hate that guy. Hours of fun, honestly, hours of entertainment. Uh, and then if we do quit, I think the server will... Did I not implement the quit command? Well, if we control C, does this just... I guess this will just like disconnect after a bit of time. And if I try, hey, it won't do anything. Yep, there it is. So that's gone now. Uh, and if I try connecting, it won't be able to, of course, because the server is down. There it is, just stops after a while. But if I restart the server, we connect. We should be able to get in. And there you go. Haze everywhere. So thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. All of this source code is going to be on GitHub just for free for you guys to take a look at and learn from. Um, I guess I should probably add some disclaimers and that is the fact that there's no security <laughs> really to this. Uh, so, you know, use at your own risk. People can obviously manipulate these messages. They can write custom clients. I've written the server in a way that hopefully won't result in everything being destroyed. Uh, if I'm wrong in saying that, please let me know. And from this kind of mega video, I have a few spin-offs that I kind of want to make. Uh, maybe like a code review of all of this because I haven't really gone through the code in detail and also getting walnut like with the UI so the non-headless walnut the head walnut to run on Linux because at the moment that doesn't so this client only works on Windows the server of course in headless mode does run on Linux that's what we're doing here but not the GUI client so that might be an interesting video just kind of bringing walnut onto Linux, onto Ubuntu, because I haven't done that yet. But let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Hopefully this was a good video and was helpful uh, to you guys who want to play around with networking. Again, Game Networking Sockets, just a really, really good library to use. I really like it. Would work Valve. Uh, and we've stolen a bunch of code from Hazel, so maybe Hazel will steal some code from Walnut and actually end up integrating something like this client server API or whatever into Hazel so that we can make multiplayer games in the future. Speaking of which, also might be nice to use this to actually make a multiplayer game. So maybe that lies in the future as well. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to check out hosting.com slash churno to get your server. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.